for making us as those who are with understanding. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. We bless your name, Jesus. I bless your name. Thank you for another Tuesday again. A time to learn, a time to learn, a time to relearn. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God, for another time to bond with your word, for another time that your word will enter into our lives, and there is always a change. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you. How about we just pray and say, Lord, today again, Lord, take absolute preeminence in the name of Jesus. Let your word impact me today. Let your word impact me today. In the name of Jesus, let your word impact my life. Let your word change me. Let your word purify me. Let your word sanctify me. Let your word help me. Let it come into my heart. May my heart be, be, be receptive to your word. In the name of Jesus, help my heart to be receptive to your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, how about we pray for those on their way here that the Lord would hasten their footsteps. In the name of Jesus, that the Lord will hasten their footsteps. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask, let's even pray for the word that God will be using to minister to us today. That the Spirit of the Lord would come upon him, would use him mightily in the name of Jesus. That he would, he would, he would teach by the Spirit, he would impact by the Spirit, and he himself will be watered in the name of Jesus. Oh Lord, we give you praise, oh God. We give you praise, oh God. And so we decree this service open in the name of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm a coach,
Your name is the rain. Your name is power. A strong tower makes me say, and so we say, Oh. Yes. 
And we
perfume every impurity in our lives. That you make us clean. That you sanctify us. That you make us holy. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. topic today is sanctification. Sanctification. We laid a foundation on Sunday and we began to talk about what it means to be, you know, uh, really truly converted, which is the starting point. And we touched on the fact that sanct sanctification is something that is necessary. It's critical for every believer. Too many of us just think, once I'm born again, that's it. No. We need to know everything there is to know about sanctification. And I'm not sure any human being can teach about sanctification in 30 or 40 minutes. But I'm praying that this will arouse our curiosity and we will study more about it. You would have noticed that, well, not just this year, even starting last year, but more so this year, uh, we're trying to be very careful about the topics we're teaching. We're trying to focus on the building blocks that will take us from here to heaven. We're trying to avoid topics that will just excite and then won't have any value. Because too often in the church these days, we go, we shout, we make noise, but we're not growing. We're not growing. So it is my prayer that this topic is one that will bless us. We started on Sunday, we will continue today sanctification. So who has heard about sanctification before? I hope there's a mic ready. Yeah, who has heard about sanctification? I just want to have a, an idea of what you understand sanctification to mean. It's Bible study. There's no wrong answer. We're all learning, including myself. Praise the Lord. I think it means to be set apart to be used by God Lord, correct sir. anybody else want to add something you know one thing that is very interesting in the Old Testament when the Israelites were um, when you know, at the time of the Exodus, there are many places that God uh, God would say to Moses, okay, tell, your, tell the people to get up and sanctify themselves because tomorrow I will, you know, I will visit them. And on one occasion, Google said, Moses, please, oh, don't worry, you just go. Let us stay here. For God to have told them to sanctify themselves, that tells me that if you are not sanctified, God will not fellowship with you. If you are not sanctified, God will not visit with you. If you are not sanctified, he definitely will not use you. If you are not sanctified, he, you know, you will not get the best that he has to offer. How many people would just go out and you see a beggar, dirty, hasn't had a bath for months and then you just love to go and sit with them and hug them and just cuddle with them. How many? Let me see your hand. <laughs> Nobody. And don't forget the eyes of the Lord are too pure to behold iniquity. Oh, he loves us. He loves us. But it is his desire that we keep getting washed. We keep growing in holiness. I pray that will be our testimony in the name of Jesus. 
Sanctification means to sanctify. I mean, to literally set apart for the master's use, like Sister Queen said. It is also the act of becoming holy. It is not a one-time event. It is not a destination. It's a journey. So you don't say, ah, don't miss church on Sunday. Why? Pastor said everybody is going to be sanctified. <laughs> That's not how it works. Or we can talk about it. We can pray about it. We can teach about it. But sanctification is a process. It is a continuous process. And guess what? It is possible to allow God to sanctify you to a very, very high degree. You may not get to 99 or 100%. Maybe you can get to 99. But guess what? The rest, you continue where? Well, how many would even like to be 99% or to 99%? 0.9999% because as long as we're in the flesh maybe now and again you make a little mistake now and again you do this or that it's a journey salvation is when you come to Jesus that's step one do you want to surrender your life to Jesus you say yes then you come and then a prayer is made father wash this your daughter or this your son in the precious blood of jesus forgive their sins blah 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 and we say to the person repeat after me lord jesus come into my life be my personal lord and savior that means the person if they genuinely believe in their heart and confess with their mouth the person is born again. The person has made Jesus Lord of their life. They are saved. But that is only step one. Praise the name of the Lord. You see, God in and through Christ Jesus came. He bled. He was crucified. He died for us on the cross of Calvary so that we can get to the place of repentance. We changed our minds and we said, ah, you know, repent is like reversing. I'm not going that way again. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to make Jesus the Lord of my life. So now that we have repented, now that we are born again, it is time for a new life. It is time to start that new life that will take us all the way into eternity. Praise the Lord. I'll give you an example. If you got a green card, you know, the green card makes you a, you know, a U.S. citizen, right? So imagine if you get a green card. Glory be to God. And then you get on a flight. And then you land in the U.S., before you leave here, they process some papers at the embassy, giving you so you are a U.S. citizen. But the moment you land in the U.S., are you used to how they do that? No. You don't even know how they walk. You don't know how to get to it. You don't know anything. But you are a citizen. Is that not correct? That's like salvation. But after a while, they will now be showing you, ah, okay, this is your house. Oh, this is where your office is. So in America, if you want to drive, you don't drive, you don't drive against traffic as we do. <laughs> we don't do all this. You know, they'll begin to show you. This is how we do this one here. If you want to uh, go somewhere, you don't get there and you start saying, uh, please, I want to enter access card for most offices and things. You think there is gate man waiting? You know, everything is automated. So after a while, you begin to know more and more and more and more. Is that correct? Do you know it may take you a long time to know everything? That's if you can know everything. That's what sanctification is. Salvation is I'm now a U.S. citizen. And then you just land in the U.S. 
you now have the rest of the time, the rest of the life to begin to learn how to live, how to work, how to do this, how to do that. That is what sanctification is. And then the more and more you are learning, very soon, by the time you call a friend you haven't spoken to in a while, ah, you say, who is speaking? You say, ah, it's me now. It's what is it? Hey, now wow. See how your voice sounds like uh, an American. Why? Because you are beginning to speak like them. Is that correct? Then you begin to dress like them. You can't wear slippers in a coat. <laughs> you begin to dress like them. <coughs> you begin to drive like them. You begin to do everything like them. That is what sanctification is. So that you begin to do as they do in heaven. So very soon we begin to walk in holiness. We begin to be like God. Don't forget he said, let us create man in our image and in our likeness. And what is God? Is he a dirty God? He's a holy God. And he even said, be holy for I am holy. So sanctification is a process where we begin to be more and more like God. We begin to walk as he walk. We begin to talk as he talk. We begin to do everything like him. And you know the truth. Everybody in the Bible that you saw exhibiting great power, you can be sure that they were sanctified. You can be sure that God had first, you know, by his grace, taken them on a journey. And so he could trust them with power. Can you imagine? One person said, he's not going to reign except by my word. God must have trusted that fellow. That fellow could not have been dabbling in sin. Am I correct? Different people that did amazing things. You can be sure that God, before he will release his power. Or let me give you another example. Once I went to do some work on my car. Um, I think it was something to do with the remote control or whatever. And in the process of testing it and this and that, the battery ran down. It's a good battery, but it ran down. And so, fortunately, I was in the place where they do very near um, a lot of car, people selling car parts and all that. So the person that was doing it now called one of his, one of the people next door that sells batteries, please come and help him start the car. They asked if I had a jump cable. No, they brought they brought their own jumper cable. And they brought it. And they first brought one battery that they said was good. And they connected the jump cable to the car and to something else. And they tried to start it. It wouldn't start. Ah! But this battery is good now. They brought another battery. It still wouldn't start. Then they went to bring a brand new battery. They didn't, they just opened it and connected it. It still wouldn't work. It was just making small sound. That's when we realized that, oh, it's not the battery. Guess what it was? It's the jump cable. You know, they're supposed to make it with either copper or, you know, pure copper or good quality. But because they've used adulterated materials, maybe a mixture of iron and copper and whatever. So it was not transmitting power. So I now remembered that there was one in the back of the car. Now, don't forget the windows, everything was not opening because of the, the battery had run down. I had to climb in and try to open. Eventually, I got it out. It came with the car. Very strong. As soon as they put it and they st the car just started. What am I saying? If you are not sanctified, the power of God cannot flow through you. If you are not sanctified, some of the benefits that we keep talking about cannot reach you. If you are not sanctified, you may not even hear him up to where you will see him because his eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. But if you are, you will be having conversations with God. He will be telling you things. My daughter, do it like this. Do it like that. My son, let me show you how you solve this problem. 
because he would love to fellowship with you. So there's so much more to our faith than just being born again. That's just the start. Apostle Paul emphasized this so much in the New Testament. So much. I'll read just a few of the scriptures where he is trying to make us understand the importance of sanctification, the importance of living in holiness. In Romans chapter 6, verse 19, he said, Romans 6, 19, um, Brother Great, I didn't forget to send the scriptures, but I just realized that maybe I'm partly responsible for making the people of God lazy with the Bible. So I want us all to be opening our Bibles. Amen. Uh -huh. eh? Eh, don't take your time. You can show it, but take your time. So that somebody would have opened it for us already. Is that good? It's good now. We must learn this Bible, though. Please. We must learn this Bible. <laughs> so Paul said, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now, yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. So he's saying, yes, you are born again, but it's time now to take your hands out of filthiness. Don't yield your body, your members, your organs, don't yield your senses to unholiness. It's time to change master. Because whom you yield yourself to is your master, right? So he's saying it's now time for new management. Again in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. He says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, how many people agree that Jesus is holy? You agree? If we now say we are Christians, and we know Christian means what? Christ-like. How should we be also? Holy. It means we should walk also in holiness. You can't say you are a Christian, and Jesus will do this, and then you do another thing. Remember this thing we used to say before, WWDJ. JD, WWJD. Who knows what it means? Anybody? What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do in that situation? If Jesus would go left and you go right. Sorry. Again, in Philippians 2.5, he said, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, emulate, copy the attitude of Jesus. In 1 John 2.6, he says, He that saith he abided in him ought to walk as he walked. Did you see anywhere that Jesus told a lie? Eh? Talk to me now. Anywhere that uh, maybe it was, uh, uh, what else? It was, uh, you know, stealing something. Anywhere it was causing trouble or, you know. So if we don't see it in Jesus, should we see it in ourselves? No. Praise the name of the Lord. Sanctification is a very, very important thing. It's a very big deal. I should read it some more scriptures. Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter 1.16 Be ye holy, for I am holy. Again, 1 Peter 2.5 1 Peter 2.5 Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Again, in Hebrews 12.14 Hebrews 12, 14. It says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. 
in First Peter chapter two verse nine. First Peter two nine, it says, "But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy, a peculiar. Don't forget, holy nation." And then it says, "Why? So that you show forth the praises of Him who hath called you." out of darkness into his marvelous light. All this is painting the picture of being sanctified. And then this one that is frightening, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. It says, Know you not that ye are temples of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And then it says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So sanctification is a big deal. The Bible says, walk out your salvation with fear and with trembling. If you just stay at and born again, it's not, it will not be long before the person backslides. You must keep pressing on the upward way. You must keep striving to be like Jesus. Keep working hard to be more like him. That's when he can use you. That's when he can talk to you. That's when he can visit you. That's when he'll be happy to come and fellowship with you. Like we said, salvation is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing experience of God's grace that transforms us into who God intends us to be. So, grace saved us. Sanctification, I mean, grace saved us. And it's still the same grace that takes us on the journey of sanctification. You know, the more we get increasingly exposed to his word, the more our hearts are transformed. John 17, 17. Say, sanctify them, O Lord. Thy, sanctify them. Thy word, O Lord, is truth. I'm not sure if it has the O Lord. And let me paint you a very simple example. Something that I experienced. So, some time ago, when I had just given my life to Jesus, and I was attending some teaching classes. I wasn't even in the Redeemed Christian Church of God then. And I had just, you know, I had just finished my studies, and um, like a young man, I had a lifestyle, I had interest, I had things, music, every, you know, just a whole kind of, you know, the places I go, the things I do, I used to smoke, I used to do so many things. And then one particular day, and you know, those days, there were this, many of you are probably too young to remember one musician called Yellow Man. It was like a mixture of rap or something and reggae. The lyrics were dirty. Ah, the lyrics, oh my God. Well, I, I think it's probably worse these days, so maybe I should, maybe I should, but it was terrible. But I, you know, had a nice car, had a nice sound system. I used to blast my music. So this particular day, we came out of, you know, believers class, that's not what they call it in that church, but just teaching. And we had learned something along those lines. Nobody said, uh -huh. so when you get home, stop watching this. Stop listening to this. Stop doing, no, no, but just the word came out. And after the class, I got into the car to go home. I started the car and I pressed my CD and the music came on. Ah, somehow, somehow, the thing did not, I did not feel comfortable. Ah. I put it off. Ah, it's like, what now? I put it on again. I couldn't take it. I put it. That's how I was doing up and down. Do you know that was the end? Ha. Nobody told me, no, this kind of music is not, is not good. But something, the power that is in the word of God was, was going doing something in my spirit man and making my spirit man understand that, guy, this is your new status as a child of God. 
it doesn't go with this thing you are listening to. Very soon, other things join. It doesn't go with this thing you are smoking. No. It doesn't go with this. It doesn't go with that. And that's how the process of sanctification starts. The word by itself. You just come to church. Everybody is singing, dancing, and, and just one word. It could even be something the choir sang. It could be even opening. It doesn't have to be. But that word will be ringing. And suddenly you are like, ah, hey. Then it will just be creating a, an unrest in you. And that means that thing is on the way out. And it will go one by one by one. And you are getting closer and getting closer. That's what sanctification is about. Praise the name of the Lord. So as we get more and more exposed to his word, that's how our hearts are transformed. So you can see why I always say that Digging Deep is my favorite service. Oh, we come on Sunday, we enjoy, we dance, we preach, we jump. Where is lovely? But for people who want to grow, for people who are determined to get to heaven, ah, you miss Digging Deep. Because every instrument of the word that you hear, it will do something. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Even you may not know. Your body may not know. Your natural man may not know. But your spirit man, something is connected. Something is connecting. You know, we gave an example that inside of everybody, you can say there are two, two um, beings. One is the spirit man, the old, the, the, born, the new man. One is the old man. Or you can say one is the flesh and one is the spirit. If you feed your flesh with worldly movies, worldly music, worldly friends, all those things, your flesh will be getting stronger and stronger. It will be getting fatter and fatter. But if you feed your spirit with the word of God, with praise, with worship, with messages, with edifying movies and all that, then the spirit will be getting stronger. It's not as if you will see when those things are going on. But you just begin to discover that your life is being transformed. Your heart is changing. Things are happening. It's the word of God. So it's very, very important. Apart from digging deep, do you take time to study the word? Do you have a time every day when you open your Bible and you study a verse or two or three or four? Even when I go for my walk, going for a walk or exercising or something, I'm careful about what I'm listening to. It could even be a time I could just say, oh, you know, let me just worship God as I would do my exercise. Or it could be, yeah, this message, this thing that I want to I want to listen to that message. And I could listen to it again and again and again until something, as I'm listening to it, I'm feeding my spirit, feeding my spirit, feeding my spirit. We're talking about sanctification. Charles Spurgeon said, if his grace can make you believe, then it will also make you live holy. If that grace can make you believe in Jesus, you know, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and surrender to him, then that same grace can help you to be sanctified so that you are actually living in holiness. Another great and renowned man of God, John Wesley, said, It is through God's work of sanctifying grace, the ability to live, you know, through God's work of, sancti you know, through his sanctifying grace, the ability to live Christ-centered life grows and reflects more and more. So, as that work, as that grace is available, you suddenly find is getting, well not suddenly, you begin to find it's easier to live in holiness. It's easier to live in obedience. And by and by, you are getting more and more and more and more sanctified. That's why it's important to pray, to study the scriptures, to fast, to worship, to have fellowship with other believers. Because as we do that, we deepen our experience and our knowledge Hallelujah. So all the while, while God is working in our inner man, in our inner thoughts and motives, very soon it will begin to show on the outside. 
it starts on the inside. It says Jesus on the inside, walking on the outside. And very soon you will discover that your life, your behavior begins to align more and more with his will. It's not an overnight thing, but surely and steadily you begin to discover it's a little bit easier to walk in obedience. It's a little bit easier to live a life pleasing to God. And then the more of his word, the more of praise, the more of prayer, the more time you spend in his presence, that grace is released. And the more you're able to live a life pleasing unto him. While he's doing that, it is our role to keep pressing on, pressing on to get more and more sanctified, pressing on towards perfection. And like we said, perfection doesn't mean you won't make mistakes. Perfection doesn't mean that you don't have some weaknesses. But we're talking about a continual process of being made perfect in our love of God. And more impo most importantly, that desire to sin, it begins to weaken. And so suddenly you just discover, oh boy, it's all right, no thank you. Ah, but you know, don't worry. You discover that grace is being supplied. Praise the Lord. Is anybody with me today? Sanctification is not an exciting topic, but it's a very, very important one. And I'm going very slowly because I need it us to hear, to understand. And I'm going to stop very soon so that we can discuss. I want you to tell me what you have learned. Ask any questions. Sanctification is not one you will come and lecture and go. No. It's something that I want us to interact about. So I made my notes very small and I'm taking my time so that you can be very clear. You also need to know that sanctification may involve some pain and some suffering. Yes. Sanctification may involve mm, to stress. But that should not be strange. We are used to going through Wahala for worldly things. Is that not so? Somebody wants to pass the exam. Will you not study? Somebody wants to set up a business. Ah, is it easy? <laughs> to find the money, to find the business, to run up and down. I used to think that people that own their own businesses are that they enjoy enjoying. That, ah, maybe if I'm not in employment, if I have my business. <laughs> Until I discovered that they work harder than everybody else. Because while those of us in employment, it's like, you're, just, you're waiting for a salary to come. <laughs> the person in business, the salary depends on who. If it doesn't work, or if she doesn't work, will salary come? <laughs> so while, while employees are working, <laughs> and business owners cannot work. <laughs> I mean, the, the, while they are, while uh, business employees are sleeping, uh, business owners cannot sleep. Praise the Lord. So it shouldn't be too much of a surprise to discover that if you really are serious about being sanctified, it will inconvenience your flesh a little. It's going to trouble your flesh a little. And so the question is that, are you willing to pay the price? to be sanctified. In Malachi chapter 3 from verse 2 to 3 Malachi 3, 2 to 3 says for he is like a refiner's fire thank you for he is like a refiner's fire. I'm jumping a few things like I said for time and then in verse 3 says and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So he's going to purge them. He's going to use fire to purify. And how many people know that fire is not comfortable? If something small burns you, so I mean, now and again, maybe you want to use the gas cooker or something. And you didn't quickly put it on. You know, if that fire, or you're carrying a hot, something hot, or a hot kettle touches your hand, is it, is it not painful? 
is painful. A refiner of fire, a refiner of pure and purifier of silver, and it shall is fire that he uses to refine. When you see gold, there are many different grades of gold. You have nine carat gold, you have eighteen carat, you have twenty-two carat. I understand there's twenty-four carat, and that there are even higher ones. What's the difference? The purer they are, the higher the grade and the more expensive. So nine carat is still gold, but it's mixed with a lot of other. It has some other materials in it, so it's gold. But when you go to eighteen carat, they've removed some more of the impurities. It's only fine gold inside, so you can tell the difference. When you see twenty-two carat, ah. 24. I hear some gold are so pure that it's almost transparent. And it reminds one of the gates of heaven. You know, we're going to be walking on streets paved with gold. So to get to that point is fire. He used. It's fire. So if you want to be purified, you must be ready to withstand a little fire. Let me read you a story. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. I, I love that song. I thought of it, but I don't know how to sing it. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. That's twain meaning two. Verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4. And the post of the doors moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said, verse 5. I, then, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. This is Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, who is lamenting that I am finished. Yea, see how dirty I am. See how unclean I am. Isaiah will be lamenting. What should you and I do? <laughs> but what was the solution? Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand. What does that signify? When you have a live coal in your hand, what are you holding? Fire. Coal now that you used to light fire. So when he says live, it means it was burning. So the angel they then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. <laughs> the thing was hot. The angel had to use something to hold it. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So he lamented that he's a man of unclean lips. And so to solve that problem, fire was sent to touch what? His lips. And the result is that his iniquity was taken away and his sin was purged. So you can see again, it's fire. And that's why I said that if you want to be sanctified, if you want God to use you, you must be ready for some fire. Of course, I'm not talking about physical fire. I'm not saying that you should go and put your hand in the fire. But when I say fire, you must be ready. You must be ready to do whatever it takes. You must be ready to stand before God and allow him to purify you. You must be ready to let him cleanse you. 
you must be ready to suffer some discipline. And what do I mean? Who has ever had that experience? You are just, it's a nice day and you're like, ah, okay. Uh, maybe I will do this, I will do that. I want to go, I'll have lunch. And then you hear the Holy Spirit saying, you're not eating today, you're fasting. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, some people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> ah. Say, Lord, fasting. Ah. We're having office lunch. It's going to be a birthday. Uh, that one doesn't concern you. Oh, you're tired. And you want to sleep. And he's telling you, no, I want to talk to you. It will be like fire is burning you. When God wants to make something of you, he doesn't take nonsense from you. The Bible says that the son whom the Lord loves, what does he do? Chastise. Or chastise. If you have a son, a daughter, a nephew, a niece that you love, if he is misbehaving, will he just say, that one are your business? Is that what you do? No, if you really love that person, ah, you won't, you can take nonsense from anybody, you won't take it from them. Ah, no, 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 I want you to turn out right. I want you to be the very best. So, the one I don't care about, don't worry, do what you like misbehave. The one you care about, ah, lie, lie. I can't agree. I can't let you do that. It's too dangerous. It's not be to your best interest. So, you must understand when we say fire, if you want God to make the best of you, you must be ready to allow him to do what he will. Purge you. Purify you. Take away some comforts now and again. Ready to, ready to instruct you. And you obey without question. Now, what sanctification is not? Sanctification is not works of righteousness. It's not works of righteousness. Because the Bible says, as you know, in Isaiah 64 verse 6. What does it say? Isaiah 64 verse 6. Don't project, please. Isaiah, okay. Isaiah 64 verse 6. What does it say? Eh? Our righteousness are like filthy rags. The man of God said, Holiness is not the way to Christ. No. Christ is the way to holiness. Holiness is not the way to Christ. But Christ is the way to holiness. And I also want to let you know that you must be careful. Beware of grace. Hello. Beware of grace. You see what this man talking about? Beware of grace. Grace can trip you. Grace can send people to hell. Beware of grace. Do you know what I'm talking about? We have the apostles of grace. Say, ah, his grace is sufficient. Ah, God's grace abounds. Yes, his grace abounds. But if you start taking his grace, is that saying, I mean, let me give you an example. So you are driving and somebody bashes your car. And you look and you say, it's all right. Go. Go on trouble. And then a few minutes later, the same person is still around. And then bashes your car again. Ah. You say, ah, I hope nothing will. Ah, guy, which one now? Maybe you're almost losing control then. But you still let him go. Then he bashes your car a third time. <laughs> yeah, tell me sincerely. I know you know we're in church. What would you do? <laughs> tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. You quickly give me one. Then you now say, <laughs> say, oh boy, wait in, wait till they walk you now. Ah, they say, <laughs> they say. <laughs> ah. 
So if we keep sinning and we say there is grace, it is dangerous. I'm not saying grace is not real. I'm just saying be careful. Grace is a fountain to wash in. A fountain of blood that cleanses you. Grace is not a carpet you dust mud on every time and you just keep depositing mud on and say, let me, maybe there is grace, there is grace. No. Grace is, you stand under the shower of grace and you let it wash you. Let me read the Bible to you. Romans 6, verse 1 to 7. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the response? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, we should not serve sin for he that is dead is free from sin so that's what we mean by many of us just say there is grace there is grace god says do this you don't do it there's grace there's grace god says my son my daughter stop this thing you are doing there's grace there's grace god says hey stop getting angry and fighting on the street there's grace there's grace hey my son my daughter this thing you are drinking there is grace, there is grace. You know one day, that grace is going to finish. Say you know. So if you just keep on misusing the grace, it will not work. That's not what grace is for. Grace is, oh, I made a mistake. Grace is, I made an error. I fell. I was weak. Oh God, have mercy on me. Help me. And you resolve that you are not going that way again. That's grace. But just like, uh, maybe there is grace. You know what? This is what we're going to do. That money, we'll still spend it. We'll collect it and spend it. And we'll even pay tithes. In fact, we'll give pastor a present so he can pray for us. After that, we'll come and we'll go and pray. We'll ask for forgiveness. You know what that one is called? Presumptuous. God will have mercy on us in the name of Jesus. Two more minutes and I'm done. And then questions and comments. How to be sanctified. We've already discussed it. The word is one way. John 17, 17. Make them, let me read the message Bible. Make them holy. Make them holy. That is consecrated with the truth. Your word is consecrating truth. Another way to be sanctified is the blood. Hebrews 9, 13 to 14 says, For if the blood of bulls or of goats and the ashes of an haifa, a cow, sprinkling the unclean, if it can sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, how much more will it purge your conscience from dead works? to serve the living God. Number three way is through the Holy Spirit. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And you know what? Even God the Father himself can sanctify you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. I think this is the message version. It says, Now may they, or amplified, sorry. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. That is, 
separate you from profane and vulgar things, make you pure and whole and undamaged, consecrated to him, set apart for his purpose. And may your spirit and soul and body be kept complete and be found blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. So, I'm open for questions now or comments. And let me tell you a secret. Everybody must talk today. Yes, sir. Praise God. So, um, I was in an article uh, sometime last week, and I came across something that was saying that God does not require us to be to. He requires us to be holy. He requires us to be um, blameless. He requires us to be all of that. However, because we're in this flesh, He's not expecting sinless perfection, and that got me thinking, right? Because Scripture says that Jesus came in the flesh. This same body, there's nothing special, there's nothing more special about his body. Aside that he wasn't born um, through the normal, there's nothing more special about him, his flesh, than, than, our, than ours, yeah. because that's, that's the purpose. And then um, Matthew chapter 8, verse 48 says, Be ye perfect. As your father in heaven is perfect. And then we read um, First Peter, I think, 1.16. That says, um, be holy as I am holy. Now, it then begs the question that, okay, God is not, we're in this flesh. God is not expecting sinless perfection. And then he says, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Be holy as I am holy. As he who has called you is holy. In other words... God is actually expecting that from us, but we, we, I think it feels like we're limiting ourselves because scripture says that um, Jesus, in paraphrasing, Jesus lived through this world and he did not commit one, one single sin until the cross when the sins of the entire world was. So it's just, it's, it's a lot of jumping around. So <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes, you know, I, I hear you because it's a process. And yes, be perfect like him. Be holy as he's holy. Be holy as I am holy, for I'm holy. And like we said, and like you also said, we're still in this flesh. So there could be a mistake. There could be errors. But I think what God is looking for is a genuine heart that is perfect towards him. One that is striving to be in perfection. I mean, look at Apostle Paul. Paul was ready to be to do anything. Woe unto me if I do not preach the God. Paul was, he was just ready to, it doesn't mean he didn't do some things wrong. I'm sure he made some mistakes, but this guy was sold out. Or David, oh my God, David. <laughs> you all know David's report card. And yet, God made the point of saying, David, son of Jesse, a man after my heart. David was always striving. And let me tell you something interesting about David. David did many things wrong, but he never repeated one sin twice. As far as I know. Maybe somebody can prove me wrong. You understand? So if today David did this and then God sent prophet, they would say, yay, yeah, I've missed it. He will roll and beg God and this and that. And that's the end of it. He, will, he may do another thing. <laughs> He may do another thing, you know, but he will not do the same thing again. And then maybe something else happens. You know, so David did not much, but his heart. Meanwhile, you know us now. You know how we do now. God has been ministering to you, telling you, my daughter, my son. Mm, that thing. You say it second time, third time, fourth time. And because it's merciful, you go to church one day. And then pastor is making noise about, hey, don't do this thing. You say, ah, what's this now? Why is this man harassing me? God is still speaking to you. You don't listen. You are going to work the next day. 
they are playing one tape inside the car or the bus. It's talking about that same thing. God can be sending people to you. You, you will still be doing it. Is that not what we do? No, no, I beg, I beg, I beg. So that's an example that sometimes our hearts, our, our hearts, our heart is hardened. So even though David did a lot of stuff, but I think David in his heart was tender, ready to embark on that journey. Was on that journey. Maybe his own path was a bit more difficult. So yeah, there could be errors, there could be mistakes, but God expects perfection. And I think at the minimum, he's looking to our hearts to see how serious we are. You know, like Daddy Gio prayed a prayer and said to God, Lord, if I will offend you tomorrow, kill me today. Uh, God says, okay, this person is serious now. Praise the Lord. Okay, go ahead, sir. So, a follow-up question. Um, there are people that in... They are um, they really they really in their hearts want to live holy and righteous, but they um, they just find themselves falling into let's say particular sin. Um, let's say for instance, um, maybe it's lies or stealing. Let let's let's use something common we use to see a lot of us here. Let's do fornication. So um, in their heart of hearts. They really, really want to live like that, but they just find themselves that when the temptation comes, they are not, they are probably not strong enough. And afterwards, they go uh, into the um, guilt and the shame and all of that, all of that, all of that. Their hearts are, they want to live, but they don't. So, um, it's a tough one. Why is it tough? Because if you don't utilize every weapon at your disposal, you may still end up being guilty. I'll give you an example. You know, we used an example about salvation being you get a green card to America, and then sanctification is getting used to the American way of life. So if you get there and you drive on the wrong side of the road, and then you, be, you just do things the way they do it in Nigeria, one day you, in fact, one day you are pressed. You just stand by the road and you start to wee-wee. You know what will happen, right? They will arrest you. And then you say, oh, sorry, I didn't know. That's how we do it at home. They say, okay. They say, we'll believe you. We're going to let you go. Please don't do it again. And then a week later, the same policeman is passing. And he sees you doing the same thing. Maybe you beg him, beg him, beg him. Say, okay, we'll just pay a small fine. You know? What I'm trying to say is that after a while, what do you think he will do? He will arrest you, lock you up, do everything. So, what should that person have done? I get it that it's not deliberate, but there are many ways we fall into sin that we really didn't fall. And I'll give you an example. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the enemy, devil goes about as a roaring lion. So, I've just given my life to Jesus. I'm still trying to find my feet. I've fallen a few times. You know, I've been tempted and I've fallen. And then I'm like, oh Lord, help me. I, you know, I'm praying and fasting. And then a friend comes and says, ah, please, I'm inviting you especially to my birthday party. Holding at uh, Quillocks, Quillocks, Quillocks. Uh, so everything is free. It's going to be ah, I don't want to go to Quillocks. So, but this is my tight friend. We grew up together, so I think it would not be good if I don't go. What do you think? Is that the right action? Eh? You know when he fell. The person fell, not when he got to the club. He fell when he made the decision to go to the club because he will surely fall. He will get there, he will see gyrating bodies, he will drink alcohol, he will fall. And then he will say, hey, Lord. Lord God said, shut up, my friend. When you were going, you didn't know you were going to enter trouble. Okay, somebody says, ah, 
Lord, I've never fasted before. I want to fast. I want to fast. And then he says, ah, okay, you know what? I'm tired of the house. Let me, let me just take a walk. Let me go and visit my friend that works in a mega chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and the friend says, ah, I'm glad you're here. Anything you want to eat today is on me. And then he, he falls. Just, I mean, just, please, when did he fall? Why would you go to mega chicken when you are fasting? You get what I'm saying? So there is a sense, Brother Great, or Dick and Great, in which we can, by being sober and vigilant, God provides an escape from those things. But if we don't take it, then we will land inside and then we say we fell. That doesn't mean that God cannot forgive or grace is not available. But I have a feeling that the more we go and God will say, okay, you are falling again. You fell day before yesterday. You fell today. You fell last week. In fact, you, after a while, even God's self will be like an hour for you. <laughs> so, does that mean God cannot forgive? I am not saying that. Yes, there are real temptation. There are real issues. Sometimes you are in a corner and you don't even know when a lie jumps out of your mouth. But I think it now becomes our duty to say, you know what? Never again. I won't even put myself in that situation. One of the, I'll give a small example. Just a small example. Because I know what happens with um, law enforcement in this country. You are going to work. You are going to the airport. I don't want their trouble. So what are the things I can control? I always, by the grace of God, do everything within my power to make sure my documents are complete so that I will not fall into the hand of uh, if you don't give us, we're going to. Because I will not give the bribe. And then they will want to lock you. They will want to. So there are some things that you can be sober and vigilant about. Some things may still happen, no? but I believe that's one of the reasons why we're learning this. You know, and the, uh, the Lord's Prayer says, deliver us from all... How does that pray? How does, uh, temptation, Abby. Uh -huh. Lead us not into temptation, sorry. Praise the Lord. So, it's... it's uh, and uh, besides, you know the other thing? If somebody genuinely falls and God forgives him and he falls and God forgives him and if every day he falls and God forgives him, I'm sure God can forgive him. But if the rapture happens on one of the days when he has just fallen and he has not even had time to ask for forgiveness, well, where will the person go? Eh? Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Good, 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 good. In your, in your teaching, you said something about uh, how we are going to have some pains. How to? You are going to have some pains in taking decision of uh, certification. Mm. Uh, definitely, we need to drop so many things. And those are the fire that will be burning in our body because those things are going to be painful. So by not going to a club, by not taking alcohol, by not moving with certain friends, yeah. those things will be like fire to us yeah. and it will bring discomfort. Yes, praise the Lord. Very cool. uh, let me, in fact, thank you, sir. I probably shared this before. Just I'll share it briefly. So we're doing some work, some construction, and there was one a dog one. Okay, so we we were going to we needed somebody to fabricate some things for us. And um, so the, the price was much, and it was like, ah, where will we get this money? And the guy was like, well, um, you can pay it into my corporate account. The person owns his own company. He's not stealing, you know. It's not like maybe he's working for something. He owns his company. But he said if we pay into his personal account, then we won't pay VAT. And that will bring down our bill. But if we pay into the corporate account, we'll pay VAT. But this one does not sound right though. So we called somebody, a Christian also, who is in say, what is this? Ah. And the person made us understand that no, that's like circumventing. Ah, it's okay. Sir, send your corporate 
account. We couldn't afford it. It was painful, like fire. But <laughs> you either choose that one or God forbid go to, you know. So there are some decisions you will take that will be, ah, opportunities. Somebody will say, ah, come, let me do this. Let, let me get, meanwhile, you know that is not, God does not sanction it. You say, no, thank you. So you are so correct, sir. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. I just have a few comments. And um, okay. firstly, I'll make a reference to a teaching you did, um, I guess, sometimes last year, probably August, okay. talking about the permissive and the perfect will of God. Yes. And um, that teaching actually got me into deep meditation and all of that. So it seemed deep. Good. And one of the scriptures you referenced to was Romans chapter 12, mm-hmm. verse 2. Where he said, Be ye transformed by the renewal of your mind. He said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye yes. transformed yes. by the renewal of your mind. Uh, the comment I want to make there is that as Christians, we must understand that there is a place of transformation mm. that is required. Though, as we all understand scientifically, also, tra- um, transformation is not a magic, it doesn't happen in a moment. Yes. It's a process. Yes. So, but one thing that is important for us is that. We must not deny ourselves or deprive ourselves of the possibility of arriving at the point of God's desire mm-hmm. when we stand and say, I'm just like this, so God, you see me the way I am. And the moment we believe that there is an expectation, the Bible says, Paul was speaking in Acts, I guess, Acts chapter 20, there, but he said, I commend you to the word of his grace, mm-hmm. which is able to build you Hallelujah. and grant you an inheritance with the same. Yes, which sir. means that. There is a place of building. Mm. And building doesn't happen in a moment. So mm. as a believer, he said to the word of his grace, like you said in John 17, 17, like that, that that word is able to build you. Yes. So the more we believe that we can be made, mm. then that settles it. And like I just want to add another analogy is that in the place of transformation, when we look at the formation of chicken in, in code, mm. is that they are transformed from within without. The beauty and the moment the shaking is, you know, enough, uh, it breaks out the shell. Yes. One of the Christian, one of the mistake Christians make is that they try to take the transformation from outside, and it doesn't work that way. You know, outside is like you change your dressing, but you don't really <laughs> change within. Absolutely. So we allow the word of God, like you said, the first thing is subject yourself to the word, yes. subject yourself to counseling, mm. subject yourself to discipleship, and mm. before you know it, you are transformed. Ah, you are really. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's excellent. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody else? I'm really excited. I'm, I'm hearing some contributions tonight that are really, and I'm learning something as well. Anybody else? Okay. Praise the Lord. So I was just I was going to comment on this earlier and um, following what Pastor said and connecting it to what Bro Emmanuel said. You know, Pastor said earlier that um, we have two entities, so to speak. You have the flesh, the old man, you have the spirit, the new man. So if you feed the if you feed the old man, if you feed the flesh, it will subdue the spirit no doubt about it. If you feed the spirit man, it will subdue the flesh. Brother Great was saying something about young people committing sin, fornication, and the case study. You know, the truth is the truth is that when you feed your spirit man, you have, it is in, it is in the world. You have enough weapon, you have enough arsenal to fight the devil. Because one thing that the devil likes to do is that the devil will always come to test you, to say you are the son of God. He will come and test you. Let me really know if you are the son of God. He came to Jesus. He says, if you are the son of God, turn this stone to bread. So how much more us? So the word that we have is how we combat the devil. The devil will always come after what God has said. Even from the beginning, he came to to Eve. It says, did God say? So, the devil will always come. It's the same thing. But the word that we have in us 
that's what we will use to combat him. I always like to say that determination is not enough. So, one other way is to pray it out. Peter had said that he was not going to deny Jesus. But Jesus, <laughs> eventually we saw what happened. So, we need to feed the spirit man because that's how we build and build. And over time, we now subdue the flesh. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise God. Thank you. And you know, when you said he came to test Jesus, he came to test Joseph as well. But thank God that what worked for Joseph was, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I will not sin against you. And that's why Joseph was like, Ah, I won't do this thing. It wasn't easy. As in, I have to break free. And he, the wife I was going to, if he had to tear, he just ran. And in the process of running, I'm sure his garment was left behind because there was something inside of him. The word of God was propelling him, not forgetting that there's enough power in the word of God to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. So that's a very good point, which could be useful, which could fortify us against the enemy's tricks. So something happens and you discover that you made an error, you fell, you, uh, you have a, a weakness in this area. What do you need to do? You keep feeding your spirit man, stoking up yourself with the word. Keep hiding the word in your heart. You read it, you speak it, you meditate on it. Very soon, the enemy will still come. You will just discover, ah, sorry, wrong address. He will discover the word is inside of you, and he will not be able to perform his enterprise. So, thank you again for that con uh, contribution. One last one. Any? Praise the ah, I'm surprised. Two people that didn't talk today. Sister Glory didn't talk. Brother Emmanuel did not talk. Brother Emmanuel spoke. I mean, Sas Frank did not speak. Ah, what, what's happening today? They are shy. <laughs> Praise God. Let's begin to talk to God tonight. Just pray and say, Lord, purify my heart. Lord, this journey of sanctification, please help me. It's a personal prayer. I'm not going to lead you. I'm talking to God. Say, Father, please sanctify me holy. Let your word, let it turn my life. That transformation, brother, I'm not talked about. I want to experience it. Again, somebody else said it's a question of the inside. What is on the inside? Working on the outside. Purify me from within. So that it begins to show on the outside. Help me to hide your word in my heart. Like Jesus and like Joseph. That I might not sin against you.
Just as we have read, sanctify us also. Let us begin this journey that will end in eternity. Salvation is just the first port of call. Salvation is just arriving. Sanctification is starting the journey. Please take our hands and hold us. Let us, be, let us begin to walk in holiness. Let us begin to walk in perfection. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. Jesus, mighty name, we have prayed. If you know that God has answered your prayer, say amen. 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 So shall it be. In the name of Jesus. Before we give our offering, I pray for you and for myself. That that which he is doing inside of us will soon begin to manifest on the outside. And very soon, somebody will look at you and say, surely... Jesus on the inside, walking on the outside, Amen. so shall it be Amen. in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's go ahead now and worship him with our offerings. Lord, I want to know you better than I know me. Touch me, Lord. God bless you.